Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, from uh, wet and windy Canberra to this uh, Indo-Pacific Leaders Dialogue, where today I'm talking with Arthur B. Culverhouse, Jr., Ambassador of the United States of America. Um, and as is normal with our proceedings, what I'll do is I'll, uh, uh, I'll briefly go through the Ambassador's biography. Uh, AB, then I'll hand over to you to make some comments. AB will uh, speak from the podium. And then it will be back here uh, for some discussion with me and also for some questions from our audience, which I will be receiving here on this marvellous little piece of uh, uh, technology. So, AB, welcome once again. Uh, good to see you. Uh, uh, the ambassador was just reminding me about two years ago that we actually met uh, here at, uh, at ASPE. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Arthur B. Culverhouse. Uh, he was nominated as ambassador uh, to the United States, to Australia, nominated on November the 6th, uh, 2018, confirmed by the US Senate January 2, 2019, by unanimous consent. Um, uh, AB was formally sworn in by Vice President Mike Pence on February 19, 2019, and presented his credentials to the Governor-General, then Sir Peter Cosgrove, on March 13, 2019. So about 18 months or so right. uh, in at post. Ambassador Culverhouse serves as the President's personal representative to the Government and people of Australia. He leads the US mission in Australia, which is comprised of the Embassy here in Canberra and three consulates in Melbourne, Sydney and Perth. Ambassador Culverhouse has a long and distinguished career. He's the former chair of O'Melveny and Myers, an international law firm that he was associated with for four decades. He began his career as chief legislative assistant to United States Senator Howard H. Baker, Jr., um, and later served as White House counsel to President Ronald Reagan. In 1989, President Reagan awarded Ambassador Culverhouse the Presidential Citizens Medal, an award to recognize citizens who perform exemplary deeds of service for the, for the, count, for the country and for their fellow citizens. In December 92, then Secretary of Defence Dick Cheney awarded Ambassador Culverhouse the Defence Medal for Distinguished Public Service for his work uh, in the Federal Advisory Committee on Nuclear Failsafe and Risk Reduction. Uh, both President Trump and the late Senator John McCain tapped Ambassador Culverhouse to head the search to select their running mates. Uh, Ambassador Culverhouse was raised in 10 Mile, Tennessee, population AB 3,477 in 2010, I believe quite a bit smaller when you were born there. Exactly. Uh, he attended the University of Tennessee and New York University School of Law, and is the proud father of three accomplished daughters. AB, welcome, it's great to have you here. And to uh, get our proceedings underway, can I invite you to make some opening remarks? It'd be my pleasure. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter, for the kind invi uh, invitation. <clears throat> uh, thank you for uh, inviting me back here at ASPE. Uh, we, uh, I, uh, on behalf of uh, U.S. Mission Australia, uh, just let me uh, formally say that uh, that uh, we value our uh, relationship with ASPE. Uh, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute is uh, is a, a great friend and a great uh, source of uh, information uh, and uh, inspiration. Um, it's nice to be back. Uh, uh, I was first here uh, two years ago, meeting with Peter up in his office, uh, ostensibly undercover, uh, but uh, trying to ascertain whether or not I wanted to accept the president's invitation be the, to be uh, nominated, be the United States Ambassador to Australia. I uh, never told uh, Peter formally while I was here, but I think after uh, asking him uh, 30 questions in 30 minutes, uh, mostly about the foreign policy establishment uh, uh, in Australia. He figured it out uh, pretty quickly, um, uh, as did uh, Dr. Brendan Nelson, Sir Angus Houston, and the others with whom I met. Uh, I, I gave him a speech here uh, a year ago, uh, and I think the world has also well and truly changed in the, uh, uh, since, by, uh, since last August. Uh, back then, uh, August a year ago, I uh, uh, infamously said, and in fact, I was almost sent home uh, by DFAT for saying, 
uh, that I wish that Australia had the confidence in itself uh, that the United States had in Australia. Uh, that resonated uh, throughout Canberra, and um, it, uh, I, uh, I heard a few compliments and also heard a few complaints. A year later, I'm pleased to be back here to say, and to be able to say, and to be able to pay my respects to Australia's confident leadership in the world. I'm here to pay my respects to Australia's confident leadership in the world. In the past year, Australia has led the way in confronting foreign interference, disinformation, and cyber aggression. Australia has stood up for the human rights of the Uyghur people in Xinjiang and the civil rights of the people of, of, of Hong Kong. And Australia has called for an investigation into the origins of the COVID virus and for Taiwan's inclusion in the World Health Assembly. The Australian Defense Strategic Update presented a clear-eyed view of Australia's role in the Indo-Pacific region. And the Australian step up in the Pacific is less of a step and more of a leap as we sit here today. And all of this in the face of not so subtle diplomatic pressure and economic coercion from the People's Republic of China. Credit is due to Prime Minister Scott Morrison, to Foreign Minister Maurice Payne, Defense Minister Linda Reynolds and their teams. And we shall also give credit to the Labor Party front bench, which has been broadly supportive of Australia's foreign policy direction. Australia's leaders have looked at the region and the world we are living in and have said, Australia will not be a bystander. Australia will shape the world. Australia will not allow the world to shape us. Credit also goes to the hardworking Australian foreign policy thinkers, public servants, and think tanks. And in particular, I want to thank our host today, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. More than any other institution, ASPE has elevated the world's understanding of the threat that the Chinese Communist Party poses to the security and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region and the world. Journalists and news organizations in Australia, in the United States, and indeed around the globe, regularly rely on ASPE's pioneering work in exposing the PRC's aggressive methods for expanding its malign influence abroad and repressing its people at home. My friends at ASPE, the CCP is not too pleased with your work. They've made that clear with the subtlety of a sledgehammer. They've made videos casting aspersions on your funding. And of course, ASPE has always been transparent about its funding sources. We would love to see the same level of transparency, transparency from institutions affiliated with the PRC. And recently, they banned Alex Josky from entering the PRC, which is sort of like me banning Beyonce from attending my next birthday party. <laughs> I don't think she is planning on going, and I don't think, and neither was Alex. <laughs> More seriously, it's been a pleasure for me to witness Australia's growing leadership firsthand. As we often say inside the United States government, when Australia speaks, the world listens. The Australian-U.S. alliance has a long and illustrious history. And while there is a lot to celebrate in our past, I believe the best is yet to come. 
So today I will focus on the future of the Alliance, particularly on the areas I believe will be the most important for the peace and prosperity of our nations, the region, and the world. We have seen the COVID pandemic devastate lives and livelihoods. We have seen geostrategic competition intensify in our region, and we have seen disinformation run rampant. In the face of those challenges, Australia is more vital than ever. The pandemic has brought a lot of challenges, some emerging and some enduring into sharp relief. One issue which is frankly existential in nature is malicious behavior in cyberspace. That includes the problem of having untrusted vendors like Huawei in our 5G networks. Something again that Australia was quick to wake up to and that the United States has been addressing through our clean network initiative. And the most pernicious problem in this particular arena, in my opinion, is state-sponsored disinformation campaigns. Democracies are founded on openness and transparency and the free exchange of ideas. Authoritarian regimes seek, even as we speak, to exploit those principles in your country and mine and throughout the world. Today, vast networks of bots amplify PRC and Russian propaganda and disinformation, seeking to sow chaos and undermine confidence in our democratic institutions and values. Those malign gray zone tactics go hand in hand with increased PRC aggression in the Indo-Pacific region. Australia and the United States are committed to addressing those challenges together. At the recent Osman 2 plus 2 ministerial consultations, which I was honored to attend, our countries announced a new joint working group between the Department of Foreign Assets, or Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia, and the State Department in the United States that will monitor and respond to false narratives propagated by bad actors. Our nations also established at Osman a bilateral force posture working group to develop recommendations that will advance force posture cooperation in the Indo-Pacific to secure a more secure and stable region and deter coercive acts and the use of force. Another matter that has loomed large during my time, my 18 months as ambassador, is the matter of critical mineral supply chains. Critical minerals, minerals essential to our economic and national security, are used in everything from fighter jets to the smartphones sitting in your pockets, which you just turned off. Most of them, most of those critical minerals are processed in one country the People's Republic of China. Near monopolies on the supply of critical minerals and on pharmaceuticals, essential medical equipment, and critical technologies distort the market and make everyone else less secure and less prosperous. At Osman, the United States and Australia committed to collaborating on supply chains so they are resilient against future pandemics against economic coercion and isolated from the use of forced labor and substandard environmental safeguards. And just last week, President Trump issued an executive order to address the threat to the United States posed by reliance on critical minerals produced and processed by our adversaries. Let me note that the president's executive order specifically calls out Australia as an ally with which we will work to reduce this vulnerability. Together and with other like-minded partners, we can secure more robust, more transparent, and more standards-based supply chains. 
The issue of critical minerals is one of the clearest examples of how our economic security and national security are one and the same. Economic security is a fundamental pillar of national security. In a time of intensifying geostrategic strategic competition, trusted economic partners are essential. And the United States and Australia trust each other. That is why the United States is and will remain Australia's most important economic partner. It is an incontrovertible fact. The United States is the largest foreign investor in Australia by far. And the United States is Australia's third largest trading partner. The American Chamber of Commerce in Australia and Deloitte recently put together an excellent report which shows that American trade and investment contributes a staggering 7% of Australia's GDP each year. That's roughly the size of Australia's entire mining sector. And it's not just the amount of U.S. investment, impressive as it is, is also the important growth-oriented sectors where the United States is investing that matters. For example, we together are aiming to put the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. Our commitment to, to pushing the frontiers of technology means that our relationship will continue to produce the jobs of the future. Of course, there's more that can be done than it should be done, and we will figure out how to do that together. Our unique economic relationship will be vital to the future prosperity of both our countries as we look ahead to a post-COVID world. Together, we can generate economic growth and stability for our citizens, and together we can drive open, innovative, and resilient markets. And together, we can bring more jobs, productivity, and solutions to our region and, and the world. In fact, the United States just announced more than 200 million U.S. dollars in new funding as a part of our Pacific Pledge. This will support the region's response to the pandemic, as well as a range of programs that will strengthen our Pacific partners and make the Pacific region more safer and more prosperous for us all. When I spoke at uh, ASPE last year, I'd only been ambassador for five months. And yet I heard countless times in those five months from too many Australians that Australia was a middle power. Any praise of Australia's foreign policy was hedged and was qualified. Australia was doing well, considering its size and its population. Australia was punching above its weight. But from my perspective, there are no weight classes in foreign affairs. And power is not calibrated solely by military might. You are influential or you are not. And Australia is incredibly influential in the world today. Not just influential for a middle power. Australia is influential, full stop. Australia is clearly playing an important great power role when and where it chooses to engage through coalition building and diplomacy not arm twisting or coercion. Nations in this region and throughout the world recognize that Australia has been a force for good for decades. And the United States of America absolutely respects that. Because the relationship between the US and Australia is not one of convenience. It's not a transactional relationship. Rather, it's built on our shared interest and our foundational values, our belief in democracy, individual freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. 
And as we look to the future, this relationship will be more important than ever. Our enduring relationship has an essential role to play in solving complex regional and global er uh, challenges in areas like health security, cybersecurity, and space exploration, areas that will be crucial to our joint future. Only by maintaining and growing our partnership with like-minded democracies can we assure that our rules-based international order continues to provide peace, prosperity, and security for all nations. As long as Australia and the United States continue to work together, I am and I will remain confidently optimistic about the future. Thank you. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Well, AB, as always, thank you for those uh, uh, insightful comments. I, I think that line about there's no weight class for influence is uh, probably the best one that I've heard to counter the punching above its weight phrase, which of course you would have heard thousands of times since you've, you've been here as, as ambassador. I just wanted to touch on a couple of the points that you made in, the, uh, in your uh, opening remarks. Um, and the first one really goes to the Pacific. Um, you, you mentioned uh, 200 million additional uh, being spent by the US on, on uh, dealing, engaging with the Pacific Islands region. Um, I, I read in our budget papers overnight of $138 million in new money from our government going into the Pacific. What, why is the Pacific Islands of all places um, sort of rising in strategic importance for, for both our countries, do you think? Well, just let me uh, not answer the question, then I'll answer it. Uh, but I just, uh, I just want to make a po the point that I come out here well and fully instructed to support uh, the government of Australia and the Pacific step up. Uh, it's an area that Australia knows well, uh, has deep and enduring ties, uh, and that uh, there's much to learn from Australia uh, in our own Pacific policy. So uh, we, uh, we are uh, well instructed to follow Australia's uh, lead. Uh, it's just geographically uh, hugely important. It's a wide expanse of uh, ocean uh, in uh, an important part of the world. Uh, it is uh, an area where uh, our great strategic competitor from the north has uh, been active and um, in ways that uh, uh, threaten freedom of uh, uh, navigation, freedom of, uh, of, uh, of uh, flight, um, and um, and freedom uh, of um, our uh, coercive activities that threaten the sovereignty of the people of those of those nations, mm -hmm. and uh, we um, we've uh, we've both been active uh, in that part of the world and um, uh, in peace and in wartime, and we want it to be continue to be a peaceful part of the world. It's uh, it's it's and, it, and it's a part. Uh, we know those people uh, from us up in uh, up in the uh, Marianas and um, and your closer home, but it's it's the near abroad. We're a Pacific nation. People forget that that um, uh, the Pacific Ocean borders the West Coast of the United States and Hawaii and Alaska, and uh, and uh, I think the Pacific era uh, uh, is now um, and the Pacific step up for us is a real thing, and uh, we're focused. Uh, like lasers on it. Mm. Hey, B, we're, we're actually going global here with the webinar and I, and I have a question came through from a person who says, being a Pacific Islander, how will Australia and the United States counter China's influence in the Pacific region? And goes on to ask about the Lombrum Naval Facility on Manus uh, Island, uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, which of course is now, um, uh, I think we can describe it as a joint facility, AB, with American interest, Australian interest, uh, the Papua New Guinea Defence Force itself, of course. Um, what's your sort of answers to, to those questions? Countering Chinese influence, you've touched on that. Um, but uh, the value of Lombrum, what, what, how, how, how do you think about that from a US perspective? Well, it's an excellent question. Uh, to a certain extent, we've... Uh, uh, in the pre-COVID world, we were playing whack-a-mole and uh, watching uh, what was happening in the Pacific. And if we saw uh, uh, a lot of Chinese activity, we would, uh, in, in a defensive mode posture, 
uh, uh, rush around and uh, and counter it. I think uh, the uh, the program that was discussed at Osman and our two plus two ministerial is uh, envisions going on the offense uh, and uh, ensuring uh, good governance, uh, addressing uh, calling out the dangers of debt uh, debt trap diplomacy, uh, soft power things like we're uh, our Coast Guard, mm -hmm. uh, your patrol to boat uh, program. Uh, uh, education, uh, 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 not only uh, rising military officers, law enforcement officers, uh, future political leaders, uh, expanding our Fulbright program, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, Lumbrum, uh, it is uh, that uh, that has been discussed at great length. I think uh, the great one of the great. Um, results of Osman, Osman that came out is uh, this uh, classified agreement on for force posture initiatives where we're going to, in a, in a in informed way uh, that uh, your, uh, your defense forces uh, and our Pentagon will sit down together and work through the things we need to do regionally. Uh, to uh, to counter malign uh, influences and to reassure uh, allies. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that uh, Lumbrum will be high on that list, I predict. We've seen a, a marvelous uh, photograph of Lumbrum um, in 1943 when it was actually being uh, used as a, a staging point to prepare for the um, uh, invasion of the Philippines or the liberation of the Philippines and something like 300 vessels in, in the harbour. It's been a long time since Lumbrum's had that uh, a kind of um, strategic significance, but one senses um, it, it's coming back, AB. Hey, um, well, and of course, the uh, PNG government's got to be a, 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 an important partner. Central to. Uh, to yes. central to whatever's decided up there. And so those discussions are ongoing. And uh, uh, that's that's one where we're well to be, uh, to follow your lead. Do you think um, Australia and the United States uh, together and separately need uh, for Southeast Asia, an equivalent of the Pacific step up? Well, that's another area in which I have uh, perhaps been too provocative and almost got sent home, but uh, yes. Uh, We're trying not to send you home today. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, but, uh, but I think the Australian government recognizes it too, uh, that Southeast Asia is, uh, is a very important uh, uh, Prime Minister Morrison is, uh, uh, has uh, had important outreach there. Vietnam is, uh, is a country I know that uh, he cares a lot about. Uh, we, uh, if you look at some of the malign activities that have gone on, uh, you know, ramming, sinking a Vietnamese fishing boat, uh, the, uh, a number of the Southeast, uh, Southeast Asian countries are those that uh, are threatened by the, uh, the uh, unlawful, outrageous territorial claims of the uh, 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 PRC government. Uh, yes, we've, uh, we sometimes refer to it as the logical uh, step up 2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be the, uh, the Southeast Asia, yeah. Well, we've had a number of questions come in about the Quad meeting, which has just taken place in uh, Tokyo, maybe a bit early to get a a detailed readout, but I think very significant that we had uh, the foreign ministers of Australia, uh, Japan, the US and India meeting, particularly at this time. Um, uh, I've had one person here ask the question, is this the emergence or, or the start, the, the beginning of a, of a, a, a NATO type um, uh, commitment? Um, what, what's your take on that? And what, what's your sense of the significance of this uh, increasing uh, activity in, in a new piece of security architecture? Well, they, it, it's, it's too early to say that it's anything like uh, a NATO. I think it's, uh, but, but you cannot underestimate uh, the significance of the meeting. Uh, when I went through a confirmation, uh, I think all 22 members, 24 members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee were telling me that Ambassador I was then Mr. Culverhouse was not yet an investor. Uh, when you get out to uh, Australia, the first thing you should know you should do is uh, to move uh, uh, the quad uh, to the top of the queue. That's something that the United States and Australia need to work harder on. I got out of here and quad was a, 
a concept that everyone was intrigued about, everyone, uh, including uh, India and Japan, mm. uh, thought had merit, but uh, it was a concept. It was not a reality. This meeting uh, shows that it is now a reality, It's a, and, and it, has, uh, it has a lot of promise. I, to me, NATO is not uh, uh, what we're looking for here. I think we're looking at a number of situational alliances uh, or situational partnerships uh, of uh, like-minded it's alliance. It's probably too strong a word on on. Uh, and, but if you look at five eyes plus two, uh, if you look at uh, the democracy ten, which the uh, the British uh, are are urging to be uh, the consortium that builds the five G uh, uh, network for the future, uh, or uh, G seven plus two. Uh, the Quad is uh, very important. It's very important, uh, particularly in the Indian Ocean uh, and in the maritime space. Uh, it is, uh, uh, and it's, uh, it has lots of potential, uh, but uh, it's, it, it'll be something that I think uh, my successor and my successor's successor will be talking uh, through as we go forward. But I think it's one of the pillars. Uh, for bringing peace, uh, peace and stability and prosperity uh, and freedom uh, to the region. Uh, but there are several such pillars. So on, on the prosperity point, I mean, I mean, it will have escaped no one, least of all our friends in Beijing, that what we have with the Quad is a meeting of the region's most consequential democracies. Yes. And, and it seems to me that that can't be um, accidental. So I'm interested in your views on that. But on, on your prosperity point, um, do you think the Quad um, has a role to play on the supply chain issues that you raised in your in your speech? Yes, uh, and we don't have a, a, a an informed readout. We just saw the the communique, uh, but we know that they talked about uh, health security, uh, maritime cooperation, uh, the post you know post COVID um, world uh, humanitarian assistance, uh, and uh, those are issues. Uh, I think, I think these uh, partnerships of like-minded should will be, I predict, going forward the cornerstone for economic cooperation, uh, for uh, uh, for regional development, uh, for uh, uh, di distributing the vaccines when it's available. Uh, but yes, uh, these uh, in supply chain, uh, lots of people believe that India has a very important role. Uh, uh, given uh, its economic needs and economic capabilities uh, in uh, bringing a, a, a supply chain resilience uh, and, and to particular economic sectors where there are none now. For instance, uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, on, on a number of uh, pharmaceutical products, uh, thought that we had supply chain resilience because they were manufactured in India, uh, but a lot of the raw materials so uh, uh, we're from the PRC, so there's more to be done. Yeah, indeed. Um, ABA, I wanted to um, talk about Osman. Uh, you, you mentioned in your speech you, you, you were present at that meeting, and I think it's uh, it's not being rude about past Osmans to say that this one was particularly consequential in terms of the things that were agreed to in the communique. Um, I mean, all Osmonds are important, but some are more about the machine ticking over and some are more about adding new elements of architecture to the, to the relationship. Uh, what, what for you was the, the sort of the high points of, uh, of the meeting and, and the agreements that came from it? Well, I agree it's, it's the most consequential uh, of uh, recent times. Uh, I've, and a lot of the credit goes to the Australian side, uh, Minister Payne, uh, Minister Reynolds, uh, General Campbell, uh, and their team uh, all traveled to the United States for face-to-face -face meetings, knowing they were going to have to quarantine for two weeks when they came back. So that investment time was uh, well and duly noted and appreciated. And I, uh, and I think that uh, encouraged our side, my side, uh, to, uh, to make sure it was worth, uh, worth the visit. Uh, it was uh, aspirational. Uh, the uh, I can't think of a uh, of a uh, tough topic that was not discussed uh, and was not uh, uh, dealt with either in the communique or in uh, uh, delegating, for instance, to the disinformation working group at DFAT and state, which is a real thing. It's not. Uh, it's already met a couple of times. Uh, to the force posture working group is a real thing that's working 
working on with uh, and with their, the ministers and the secretaries, uh, making sure that they uh, that uh, they uh, they produce uh, uh, that they produce results. Uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, President Reagan, once told me he described a, a particular uh, bureaucracy that was frustrating him as a a great. Uh, apparatus for making poor decisions slowly, <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we did not see any of that in Osmond. We don't have those in Canberra. No, you those don't. Okay. Um, so, uh, look, let me just go to a couple of the things that came out in the communique. One was, uh, the, as, as you did in your speech also, uh, the communique talked about state-sponsored malicious disinformation and pledged that we would be working more effectively to counter these things. Can you say a little bit about how that's done. I mean, is it simply a matter of um, telling the truth and telling it more often? Uh, what, what's the sort of process that we might jointly be thinking about here to counter disinformation? I think you've got to be more active than that, Peter. Right. Uh, you've got to be more active than that uh, because what you have are the uh, social media uh, uh, is the, uh, the device through which uh, uh, the PRC, Russia, North Korea, and other uh, Iran, other malign actors uh, uh, use. Uh, and a lot of it, I mean, uh, you, you've got to attack it, I think, like we do uh, uh, in the cyber domain, uh, espionage domain, uh, intellectual property domain, where people, as we speak, are trying to, to, to steal the recipes for the COVID vaccine. Uh, and uh, it's uh, and that's what I think DFAT and state are going to be talking about. Who is doing it? How are they doing it? And a lot of it's just chaos spreading. It's it's not trying to steal classified information. It's trying to interrupt and uh, undermine confidence in uh, dem democratic processes. Look at our election. Uh, not so much trying to rig elections uh, this time around as trying to make all each and every American voter. Uh, angry at the other side and distrust the other side uh, and distrust the outcome. Uh, you'll see it like rulemakings in the United States, uh, Federal Communications Commission rulemakings, uh, where uh, uh, when I know well, uh, there were more than 20 million comments filed uh, on, in, on internet neutrality, both sides. And 80 to 90 percent of the comments file were not from uh, were from bots, uh, mostly uh, mostly from this uh, from from Russia, uh, and they're just trying to undermine confidence in uh, in uh, our processes, and we've got to push back against it and uh, and identify them, and uh, and at the retail level, at the retail level, say that of these 25 frequent commenters. Uh, on this website, of uh, uh, 19 of them are not U.S., and 19 of them are not real people. So to a completely different issue from, from uh, Osman, um, the uh, announced decision at U.S. expense to build uh, fuel stockpiles in mm -hmm. Darwin. Now, I've made the point, um, A.B., in, in earlier discussions with you that no, no one builds a large gas station unless there is an intent to actually drive your vehicle there to refuel at some at some stage. What's the um, US thinking about the, the significance of that? How should we see that in terms of broader American military strategy? Uh, it's, it's an important part of a regional security uh, strategy, but uh, I just got back from uh, four days in Darwin two weeks ago with the defense minister uh, watching our Marines uh, exercise out at Mount Bundy, um, uh, but also visited uh, Raft Tyndall, uh, where there is an uh, apron that's being constructed at U.S. expense and a fuel farm, uh, and Raft uh, Darwin, where there's an apron that's already uh, there and a fuel farm uh, underway uh, for marine aviation assets. And, I, and uh, obviously, uh, nor the Northern Territory and Northern Australia is strategically situated. Uh, you'll, I think the, the notion is there's going to be more transit, more need for fuel, uh, more air-to-air uh, uh, -air refueling that's, that's staged out of there. And our Air Force is uh, the Air Force this year because of the uh, uh, of COVID, uh, the Marines could not bring uh, 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 the uh, aviation assets they typically bring. Uh, and at the last minute, and this is a real tribute to the ADF, uh, to our Marines, to our Air Force, 
uh, and to the fact that we trust one another. And a lot of our uh, military uh, uh, officers have uh, worked in one another's organizations. Uh, but there was uh, just a few days notice, uh, there was saw an opportunity to allow U.S. Air Force B-2 and B-1 assets uh, provide an, a military exercise uh, air support uh, to Marines and ADF uh, troops on the ground. Uh, and uh, and I was refueling, uh, and it was uh, an all staged out of uh, out of uh, RAF Darwin and uh, RAF Tyndall. So that was that's the kind of thing we we can see more of, uh, and uh, hope to see more of. Uh, and if the Force Posture Working Group, uh, they have a number of uh, things on the list, uh, but you can see greater role. I think. Uh, some of the hardest negotiations to make in the, on the U.S. side are between our services, as you know, yes. uh, yeah. between uh, the Marines and the Army and the Air Force and the Navy. Uh, but uh, our Marines up there are thinking, you know, the next iteration of MRF d probably ought to include some maritime assets that another service owns. Yes, yes. Well, and, and I thought very significant that the uh, MRF D deployment happened this year in the COVID times when a number of military exercises uh, have, have had to be postponed. Uh, so, a, again, a clear expression, I think, of American strategic priority. But, but also to the uh, Australian government and the Northern Territory uh, government, indeed, yes. yeah, who took the risk that we would bring in 1,100 Marines who uh, and who would obey the COVID, uh, COVID protocols. Yes. Uh, I have to ask you this question. It was the first one that got sent through to us uh, from Western Australia. Um, it's quite likely that His Excellency the Governor is watching us, so AB, so I'm, I'm not uh, sure that this has come from him, but <laughs> it says, um, given the recent announcement of US strategic fuel reserve in Darwin, would it be a benefit to the US Navy to have a multi-use port facility to store additional strategic fuel reserves in Exmouth <laughs> to further support and sustain their activities in the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea? What, what a good question, AB. What, what's your thoughts? I have the, the greatest respect for uh, Governor Beasley, uh, former ambassador of the United States, uh, and uh, who knows more, by the way, about uh, little known presidents and vice presidents than any American. He's a, quite, a, quite a scholar of the American uh, democratic experience. Uh, you know, watch uh, you know, the, uh, I think we all recognize that the Indo-Pacific Strategy also means we need to pay attention to the end of the part, yes, and the dope part, and yeah. we need to pay more attention. Yeah. And uh, I, it's uh, I'd be outside my lane to to predict uh, what might uh, happen at any particular place, but uh, uh, both Governor Beasley, uh, Minister Reynolds, uh, and and many other Western Australians uh, think that more can and should be done in Western Australia. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I might say it was always part of the original design of the enhanced uh, military cooperation that was announced about a decade ago that um, what, what Stephen Smith, in, the then Defence Minister, used to call Part, part C, which was going to be US naval vessels rotating out of um, HMAS Stirling in, in the West. And uh, I, I guess a number of us are waiting for that sort of part C to eventuate at some at some stage. Although I, I will point out my last trip to Western Australia before COVID uh, really sh closed the borders was to visit uh, the, the USS Texas, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, one of our attack submarines who was at HMAS Sterling. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, maybe just one final question um, as it relates to Osman, although it's, it's broader really, but very strong language about China. Um, I, I think probably um, certainly the first time uh, such uncoded um, language had been used uh, relating to uh, human rights issues and the treatment of Uyghurs, the South China Sea, and a whole paragraph on, on Taiwan. Yes. So I'm interested in your views on, on that. Uh, and also maybe we can use that as a way to talk a little bit about the risks that we see emerging in the region in the relative short term uh, and your thoughts over, you know, the concerns for Taiwan security in that time frame. Peter, I think the, uh, the language on, um, on China reflects both the uh, increasing confidence and leadership of Australia. I mean, uh, we, we've been using uh, strong language about uh, uh, the PRC for a while. Uh, 
but also reflects the reality. If you look at uh, virtually all of uh, or many of the problems in the region, that the PRC uh, some malign activities lies underneath them. The uh, starting with COVID, uh, the uh, the virus originated uh, uh, in China. Uh, China was late to uh, advise the rest of the world. Or late to advise the rest of the world there was uh, human transmission. Uh, it has cost your country uh, and my country and many other countries uh, uh, heavily in terms of the blow to our economies. Uh, and uh, that's that's one issue. You'd look at the treatment of the Uyghurs, the Tibetans. Uh, uh, the uh, the fa very fact that they are, uh, as we speak, uh, uh, trying to uh, to use their cyber uh, uh, resources to to steal the recipes for the next vaccine, uh, the uh, activities on the border of India, uh, activities obviously in Hong Kong, uh, the militarizing islands that they claimed. Uh, 2017 in the White House, they were not going to uh, to militarize, and now they are sinking Vietnamese fishing boats, uh, chasing uh, Malaysian uh, uh, seismic uh, uh, vessels out of size, uh, out of Malaysian waters. Uh, uh, so I, I think it reflects the fact that uh, all of us want and need the Chinese to get back on side, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, an increasing confidence that uh, that. Uh, the rest of the world understands it. I, I believe the scales from the rest of the world's eyes have fallen uh, fallen aside as a result of COVID, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, many of uh, other countries in the region uh, are applauding uh, the uh, leadership of Australia uh, in that regard. Do you I, think it's? Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to ask. Do you think it's? Likely that China can get back on side, or are they locked onto this course for some appreciable period of time? All I will say is that uh, five years ago, uh, the, a large part of the U.S. government still believed and hoped uh, that uh, uh, economic cooperation would ultimately lead uh, China to uh, uh, to not only get to stay on side, but to be more on side mm -hmm. and to uh, and to um, uh, cooperate with the rules based regime. Um, as you and I have discussed, what is stunning to me as a nation of that large and that complexity, one person in an authoritarian regime. I uh, can re reverse direction 180 degrees. I spent a fair amount of my time as chair of my law firm. Uh, advising clients that it was safe to do business in China. Uh, I opened offices in Hong Kong, <laughs> Beijing, Shanghai, uh, and uh, we made uh, we put a lot of boots on the ground there. And uh, that was under a different regime. Uh, but uh, uh, I would hope that they uh, uh, that they're paying att paying attention to what the rest of the world's saying. I don't know. Taiwan. Uh, uh, Taiwan, we're still, uh, the Taiwan Relations Act is uh, a fundamental uh, part of uh, U.S. foreign policy. We recognize one China, but on the, uh, the same time, we are, uh, uh, our policy is that any uh, uh, differences uh, between uh, Taiwan and, um, and the mainland need to be resolved in a way that uh, is not coercive, is not bullying, and is acceptable to people on both sides of the strait. And that's why you you see us uh, you see uh, cabinet members visiting uh, visiting mm. Taiwan to send that signal. There's, there's a fairly substantial um, arms deal coming up as well involving uh, re-equipping uh, the Taiwanese military, um, and I think it's fair to say that they're in need of this. Um, uh, how committed is the U.S. to that particular deal? I think we're quite committed. Uh, it's. Um, I mean, we're going through an election, but uh, there seems to be bipartisan support for it. Let, let's turn to the election. Um, uh, I, I want to ask you a domestic question and an international question. I'll do the international one first because it comes to uh, it comes to what you've just been saying, really, about the, the strategic situation um, around China's borders. How um, concerned are you that? Um, the election in some ways may be seen in Beijing as giving them a window of opportunity to advance strategic objectives 
at a time when um, the US is internally distracted, maybe going through a complicated transition. Uh, should we be worried about um, the, the broader security position uh, during this, this time? I think we, the concern should be that, that uh, our adversaries, whether it's China, Russia, Iran, um, that they miscalculate. Uh, but, uh, but when I went through confirmation, um, I remember I was reticent in a couple of courtesy calls of, um, of what I said about the PRC. And finally, uh, uh, one of the senior Democrats on the committee took me aside and said, look, uh, we're all China hawks up here. Mm -hmm. We all are concerned uh, about what's going on. Uh, and I, I think the, what was happening with the Uyghurs was the final straw and the theft of intellectual property and the theft of intellectual property that was continuing and accelerating. So, um, look, uh, well, maybe the only advantage of being old is I, I was at university during the Vietnam War um, uh, demonstrations and the race riots. Uh, my first job out of law school was working for Howard Baker on the Senate Watergate Committee when uh, President Nixon was being investigated and ultimately resigned. I was Ronald Reagan's White House counsel when the Iran-Contra investigation uh, threatened uh, uh, his presidency and cost him a year. I mean, we got nothing done for a year, as you recall. Uh, we lost a Supreme Court uh, battle. We had vetoes overridden. Um, and uh, no foreign leader would see us, it seemed. Uh, so it was, uh, uh, I have uh, uh, full faith in, uh, uh, in the self-correcting uh, uh, mechanisms in the American Republic. We're going to get through this election. I can't comment on it. Uh, I'm subject to the Hatch Act. It's killing me because this is the first presidential campaign since 1976. I haven't been an active participant in. And uh, but um, good call. <laughs> <laughs> President Reagan used to remind Howard Baker and me that we opposed him in the Republican primary in 1976. So. Uh, Anytime you'd get particularly angry with me, he would mention that I was not for him. Uh, and um, I never had the, I always wanted to say, and we beat you, but I didn't, uh, <laughs> I never said that. So in any event, uh, uh, it was, uh, I, I think we're, th this is, uh, I've seen this movie before and we're, we're going to be fine. So there are echoes of 1967 and 68, it seems to me, in, in what we're seeing play out on the streets in the United States. Uh, and clearly a, um, a very bitterly contested election campaign. What do you say to allies like Australia that, you know, I think can only look at what they see on their TV screens about the United States domestically and, and who worry about what this means for the future of the US and for the future of our bilateral relationship? Well, I would remind, uh, Austra remind Australia that last year before COVID, uh, we had more uh, United States congressmen and senators and VIPs visit Australia than any time uh, since World War II of both parties. Hmm. Uh, people who cared a lot about the alliance who came out here, a number of whom I think were probably briefed by people in this room who, uh, and they weren't here to go to the scuba diving on the Great Barrier Reef. They did real work. They uh, They went to the Northern Territory. They uh, uh, spent time with the uh, with their counterparts. Uh, so I think the support for the alliance is deep and broad and solemn and unbreakable. Uh, you, you remind, uh, uh, as I said, and uh, I wrote an op-ed for the Sydney Morning Herald last month, a month or so ago. A, a lot of Americans were stunned uh, and taken aback uh, at. Uh, uh, particularly uh, at the, the the video of George Floyd uh, uh, dying, uh, his tragic death. We thought we'd come farther than that. Uh, it's uh, uh, the uh, the riots in Detroit and uh, Los Angeles uh, of the uh, of the late '60s were uh, reminiscent. But uh, at the same time, I would remind you that. Uh, we have 50 states. We have 18,000 police departments. Uh, you have seven or eight. Uh, not all of them are, um, are as good as they should be or could be. Uh, not all of them are, 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 uh, are a, a number of them need work. Uh, and uh, we've, uh, we're going to get through this. There'll be reforms. We'll make steady progress. Uh, and uh, we'll be fine.
Now, I'm not going to ask you to sort of make any partisan observations, and as you pointed out, you really, you're not allowed to anyway, but is some of the underpinning philosophy of America first, a, a sort of a tougher perspective of America's role in the international world, is that likely to survive the election outcome come what may, regardless of who's actually put into the White House? And again, what does that mean for allies? Well, it will and it won't. Uh, President Trump uh, has caused a lot of people, uh, including me, to take a look at things that we thought were um, were working in America's interests, like the North American Free Trade Agreement, and it wasn't. It uh, it uh, was probably uh, well intended and uh, may have worked, uh, but it was hollowing out a number of our manufacturing capability in a lot of a lot of respects. American companies were doing well, but American workers were not. Uh, and so I think you'll see more attention on uh, on uh, on what does something, uh, what does a particular initiative mean for American workers. But on the other hand, if you look at how we're thinking about critical minerals, uh, where Australia and uh, Canada are specifically named as trusted partners with comparative advantages that we're going to work together on critical mineral supply chains. Uh, if you look at uh, a lot of the talk, that a lot of the, the discussions that are ongoing on supply chains, on uh, PPE, on, uh, uh, on how we're going to get uh, the COVID vaccines distributed throughout the world, those are international uh, undertakings. Uh, Prime Minister Morrison has often said that we need to look at a lot of these alliances as the building blocks uh, in the post-COVID world, not only strategically, not only in the intelligence world, but economically mm -hmm. and healthcare wise and uh, humanitarian relief and infrastructure building. And uh, there's bipartisan support uh, for what we're doing. Uh, uh, I think uh, we hear is from as many uh, Democrats in Congress uh, uh, on uh, when, when are you going to turn sod on the electrification project in Papua New Guinea, uh, Palau uh, Spur, uh, that uh, uh, hopefully that uh, Australia, Japan, and the U.S. will announce soon. Uh, those are those are things where, I, where there's a lot of bipartisan support. That, that's interesting, AB. And um, uh, another element to this, which was um, um, hinted at in Australia's uh, strategic update of a, a month or two ago, was um, the idea of complex munitions production, which is really code for missiles, uh, happening in Australia. And um, I, I can see a lot of sense in that because uh, not, not simply from an Australian perspective, it also is something which creates redundancy and a sort of second order of capability that the United States might, might draw on. Um, any, any thoughts on that particular uh, initiative? Well, just first let me say the uh, Defence Strategic Update, um, it surprised us. It was more forward leaning than uh, than we envisioned or hoped. It was it was uh, it was really a spectacular piece of work, uh, and um, I was a great scene setter, stage setter for for Osman, uh, and uh, I, I think uh, uh, was much applauded. Um, the uh, there needs to, uh, the, 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 we need to uh, emulate what we've done on the F-35 mm. across the defense spectrum. F-35, I think there's 70 Australian companies uh, that are contributing to F-35 production. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot, uh, makes a lot of sense uh, to have uh, ships and planes uh, repaired here that instead of hauling them all the way back to the States. Uh, clearly, uh, as we, uh, if you look at the, the strategic uh, uh, fuel reserve uh, idea up in Darwin. Uh, the uh, you, you can uh, the next logical step is there'll probably be more ships and uh, more planes and ships uh, coming through Australia. So yeah, uh, it's um, the whole idea behind Five Eyes, as you know, is it started out as intelligence sharing, but it's much more than that mm -hmm. today. It's much more than that. It's a lot of defense uh, interoperability. Uh, uh, you now have Five Eyes finance ministers, Five Eyes development ministers uh, meeting. So I, I think the logical building blocks are that we'll have much more uh, shared uh, production uh, in the defense sector going through. Um, 
Yeah, so I was uh, enormously pleased um, just a month or two ago to hear Josh Frydenberg talking about five eyes amongst uh, treasurers and finance yes. ministers. And you think, wow, there's really a breakthrough happening in terms of how we're thinking about our cooperation in a much broader sense of security. Exactly. Abby, we've just got about a minute or so left. I, I wanted to end on a, on a personal note. Um, as you said, you've, you've been here for about 18 months now. Um, uh, and um, of course, uh, spending time in Australia to know us is to is to love us. Um, <laughs> have you had you been surprised in any way? Um, has anything delighted you? Has anything disappointed you in terms of your experience of uh, being in this country? Well, the, the thing that's delighted me most is it's a, it's a nation of plain speakers. I don't have to diagram sentences out here to understand what you're saying. <laughs> I, I mean, there's a, there's, there's, there's some terminology I don't get, but it's usually in the sports world. Right. Uh, right. But uh, when you're meeting with uh, DFAT uh, or the uh, uh, or the prime minister, or whatever, you, you know what people are saying. They come straight at you, um, and uh, that's good. I uh, the greatest memory I uh, at this ten seconds is when we lost the three aviators uh, yes. Yes. Uh, and the, above the fire grounds in New South Wales. Uh, the expressions of uh, sympathy from all across Australia. School kids would write letters to uh, uh, to the embassy, and that would, that was uh, a heartwarming, and uh, and really shows uh, how close our alliance is. Well, it's been a fascinating conversation, Ab. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for answering at least some of the questions. There were so many uh, we could have spoken for another hour. Uh, but can I thank you all to please thank Ambassador Culverhouse. Thank you. Thank you.